Good day, fellow investors. I'm pretty bullish on copper long term because it connects a lot of the investment trends, the positive investment trends out there from electrification, electric vehicles, renewables, green energy, India, the middle class emerging. But investing in copper, copper miners, is not that simple. And over the last month, I have looked at all copper miners to refresh my analysis rebuilt the copper thesis and in this video I want to share my findings and if you want a comprehensive investment analysis on copper here it is plus I'll give you a risk and reward investing estimation of Freeport McMoran one of the largest copper miners out there we're going to discuss the current copper situation, copper prices, what impacts copper prices, copper supply, copper demand Freeport McMoran, overview, give an overview of the business, make cash flow valuation, and then also discuss risk and reward, potential outcomes for the stock from the current level perspective. So let's start with the discussion. So as I said, I'm bullish on copper because a wind farm requires 4.7 tons of copper. So with more wind, with more renewables, as that's the main trend out there, there should be more copper usage. Plus, a cyber truck needs a truckload of copper, a plug-in electric model, 109 kilograms, that's about 240 something pounds, which is five times more than a normal gasoline car, and also almost three times more than a hybrid. But this is one of the positive trends. However, current automotive demand is just 6.6% copper demand. If that quadruples over the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years, if all cars go all electric, they'll also find a way how to limit the use of copper. But still, that still might add another 6.6% of copper demand, which is not that impactful. Other things are more important when it comes to copper even than EVs and wind. This is the most important trend. And also copper gives you a way to invest in India. It's a treacherous stock market with interesting owners. I know because I tried investing in Vedanta, got screwed there. But another way to invest in those emerging middle class booming markets is to invest in commodities that Given the growth ahead for the economies of Indonesia, India, Mexico, etc., might see huge jumps in demand like it was the case for our China. If that happens, copper long term, and that's why I'm bullish on it, is a good metal to be exposed to. This is the middle class projections. So 1.5 billion people will be added over the next 10 years likely, 1.5 billion people, 2 billion people over the next 2-3 decades. That's a lot of new things as they enter middle class life standards. If 2 billion people just buy one piece of white goods, that is adding then 2 million tons of copper demand. That's 10% of current copper demand. And that's a huge, huge tailwind for copper and this is what I like in the long term. I'm not that exuberant on okay copper prices are going to explode but I like the margin of safety that all of this and the middle class gives me. However you will see uh, we discussed in the last video how companies are promoters so are also copper miners so be very careful in their projections. This is from 2014 they were assuming 2.5% global growth that should push copper demand higher, higher and higher. Global growth was 2 point something percent, but copper demand is still at 24 million tons. Where it was here, according to th their charts, it's not even here and certainly not even close to being 35 million tons in 2024. That would imply a 33% growth. So it's not really likely it will grow fast, 
but it will be there, it will be stable, which gives, which gives a margin of safety. So be very careful when looking at these projections. And it all depends on China. China creates 51% of global copper demand because most of copper is used for infrastructure and construction. And they did a lot of that in China. And now China is transitioning into a surface economy and that's what pulling copper demand growth down because less copper, less infrastructure. And the hope is that sooner or later, but maybe not just now, that's why I'm always saying copper for the long term, India and the other emerging markets in Asia cover for the loss or the slowdown in demand from China. So electric vehicles, the green story, everybody pushing the green story. There is a lot of greenwashing there. You have to look at the numbers. And when you look at the numbers, China is still the key factor when it comes to copper. And it will likely be like that for the next few years. Therefore, the key is China. And then when you come to copper supply, it's not that there is a limited amount of copper. There is plenty of copper to produce it for the next 30 years with just the reserves needed out there. If you go to the identified resources and more, then you can produce copper and cover for demand for the next 100 years and more. So it's not like there is a limit to the supply of copper. Plus, if we look at, this is what just the top six producers growth supply that's going to be added to the market. A total that I calculated by looking at each copper is a copper producer is about 2.8 million tons, which is about 13% of current supply. And I don't know that copper demand is going to grow that fast, especially with the current economic situation where everybody's focused on the virus and not so much on the debt piling, on the issues that really matter long term for an economy and for the health of the global situation. Therefore, I see a little bit lower demand for copper, which means that there will be ups and downs and copper prices will certainly be volatile. And therefore, we are now at above 3 per pound, 3.9 cents or something. But if you look at the ups and downs over the last 15 years, copper is definitely cyclical. And before investing in a cyclical, you need to understand the cycles. And with copper, we have we already spoke about the safety of the demand being there from China, from um, emerging markets, from electrical and from green transformations, that's sure, but we have to put that into a context of price. My estimation is that average prices will be in these ranges, up to 3 and down to 2.5. Five. Of course, in exuberance, we can see 3.5, 4 for short period of times. But if that happens, then new supply will come and then prices will go down again. And so these are the cycles. And when it comes to such cycles, you need to have a strategy, which is what we'll discuss later in the video. So stay tuned. This is also the cost copper curve and sustainable, including sustainable costs. And you can see that 90% of production has costs that are around $2 per pound. And these 10% are really the drivers of spikes in copper prices. But as soon as copper prices go up, it's easy and we have seen production will keep adding. So I think that normal level should be here somewhere over the short and medium term. Long term, we'll see how demand develops from the middle class booming and electric vehicles. Of course, if you look at copper stocks, Freeport is always the most exuberant there. They immediately try to sell you a major rally. And that's also something that we're going to discuss as we discuss Freeport. When investing in copper stocks, and this is all something to keep in mind as we go into Freeport, you need to know 
how long are they going to mine? How, what's the life of mine? Because 10 years is much different than 30 years. Is there potential for growth, for exploration? Is it in a good jurisdiction? Will there be higher taxes? Are the unions striking like a lot of it is happening in Chile now? So that's something you really need to know when it comes to mining. Plus, what are the mining costs, the sensitivity to those fluctuation, what is the debt of the specific mining mining company, higher debts, and all those things are very important when it comes to copper mining. Let me continue with Freeport, where we also discuss all these matters and put the stock into perspective, a risk-reward perspective, and then you'll see if copper is something for you or not. Freeport McMoran, as we have seen the cycles with copper, so does also the stock move. Huge exuberance when everybody's positive about copper, but also big declines when people are negative for copper. On a long-term historical perspective, the stock is where it was in the 1990s, still now, and cheap compared to exuberant times. If there is a major rally in copper, this can easily double, but if not, it can also go back to the bad, bad times and levels. The market capitalization is 25 billion, keep that in mind later for valuation. And this is also, this is how copper stocks move. If copper prices go up, let's say 10%, copper stocks usually go up 20, 30%, especially these stable great producers like Freeport, McMoran, large producers, about greatness we can, that can be discussed. And then also vice versa, when copper prices fall, then the stock also falls significantly. And especially when copper prices go low, let's say lower than two and a half, lower than two, then really stocks crater because at such low copper prices, Copper miners aren't really profitable and that's why you see these big declines. The best opportunity is to buy them on the other hand because when things turn and we have seen the trends that push things to turning, boom, you see this huge, amazing 100, 200, 300% jumps that really can reward you in a short period of time. But you need to know what is going on. On Freeport's business, I think the business is really great, really diversified from the Morenci mine in Arizona, El Abra Cerro Verde in Latin America, Grasberg in Indonesia. So a lot of production, which makes it one of the biggest producers of copper, especially when you add the gold produced alongside Codelco, which is not listed. So we can't really invest in that because owned by the government of Chile. Nevertheless, this is the plan of production for this year going up as Grassberg mine in Indonesia is being ramped up the on underground part. Also gold sales will spike so it's also a gold miner which lowers the production costs significantly. So diversification on a global level and diversification on a production level with copper and very interesting gold. If we look at the Indonesian mine Grasberg, they, this was the transition year, then they will ramp it up, go underground and produce a lot of copper and gold. But read the fine print, they own 81% of economic benefits through 2022 and then just 50%. Plus they need to build a smelter, so let's take 50% of ownership as a given also for now. They have about 10 million in debt. They have to pay 500, around 5% is the interest rate. So about 500 million on uh, just interest per year, which is not a big deal when they're profitable, but becomes a big deal when copper prices go lower. And that's why you see all those drops when copper reaches two. With copper prices at three, operating cash flows are at around uh, four or five billion. 3.25, those will be even higher, going towards 6 if copper reaches 3.5. But operating cash flows, let's say 4.5 billion with copper at 3, is what we can expect over the longer term. The co average cost of production is around 1.2 per pound. American mines a little bit more expensive. Grasper produces copper at zero cost if you take the gold byproducts. 
into account. Let's say they make 5 billion in operating cash flows on an average year, spend 2 billion on capex, half a billion on debt, half a billion on taxes and other, I get to free cash flows of 2 billion per year. And 2 billion per year on a market capitalization of 25 billion, I have to correct it here, gives me an free cash flow yield of 8%. Life of mine is great, debt is 10 billion, so we have a debt to free cash flow of 5, mining costs are low, risk Indonesia, copper prices of course, and if there is a bull market in copper, the upside is uh, 100%. If not, if there is a crisis, the downside is 50 to 70%. So I would say I will check Freeport when it gets to 12, 10 billion in market capitalization. That's my strategy and we'll discuss the strategy in a moment when it comes to investing. Compared to a few others that I have taken from my full table, Southern Copper 5.5%, one of the most expensive there because of the high dividend, Cas Minerals has been taken out, sold at about 10, 11%, so high price for a copper miner, but Kazakhstan, Boliden, great business, a little bit on the expensive side because of quality in Sweden, Hot Bay, much more risky, Antofagasta, Chile risk, so a little bit higher. So we can say that now, compared to others, Freeport is fairly priced. And this is my outlook. If copper goes to 3.5, I assume a double in the stock. We would reach 50 billion in market capitalization. If things get bad, assume 50% down at least, but that would also create a great opportunity for buying. And then when it comes to strategy, I think you have two strategies. Given the cyclicality and the volatility, you can say, okay, I like the long-term trend with copper. I like renewables, I like electricity, I like this, I like that. I want to have portfolio exposure. Then one strategy could be, okay, I take good miner, that few good miners that I like, that I like the quality, I can accept the volatility and I put the fixed percentage of my portfolio into that. If that fixed percentage goes up, you, when in exuberance, you just reduce it back to the fixed percentage. If it goes down, you just bring it up. So this forces you to buy low and sell high around a strong long-term investing position. And that's a strategy. You have to see what works. And Freeport, I think, fits a strategy like that really well because of the additional volatility related to copper prices. Or you can take my strategy as I'm not a relative investor, I'm an absolute investor. When copper stocks will be cheap again, I'll keep watching, I keep following, keep updating, keep watching. And then when those are low risk, high long re term reward, I'm not saying that if Freeport goes down 50%, it can't go down another 50%. It can, but when it goes down from this level 50%, it's unlikely that I lose money over the long term. And that's low risk, high reward investing, which is what I do. And if you want to know more, please check my stock market research platform. There is the whole copper thesis discussed there in detail, detailed analysis on miners and a few miners, copper miners that I cover. The value that I hope to give by doing this and covering is that over the next decade, there will be one, two, three opportunities to nail low risk, high return investments. Multiply that on hopefully 10 sectors and that's an immense value that you can get. I've spent 200, 250 hours over the last months doing this, looking at copper miners. This is what I do. If you have gotten value from this, please, please click that like button.